Hello, welcome everybody. Um, let's slowly get started. It takes us out here. Um, hey, my name is uh, Jens Kohnsen. I'm with uh, Jensen Hughes. I'm here together with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jason Sutula and Mark Susky. And we're here to talk about uh, lithium ion battery hazards in uh, EV and in manufacturing environments. Uh, we'll also be talking a little bit about uh, a better battery energy storage system applications as well because that is sort of like an overlapping area where the hazards are um, can be can be similar so the agenda we have uh, prepared for today is um, we'll go over the goal of this presentation provide a very quick uh, overview of our company Jensen Hughes what we do while we're here um, introduction to lithium-ion batteries and thermal runaway that is pretty much what you know, we want to spend some time on here uh, to discuss um, uh, fire and thermal runaway. You will hear that a lot. Um, how this applies to typical um, electric vehicle manufacturing environments and uh, warehouse storage arrangements. You know, it's one thing when we produce batteries in large quantities, we got to put them somewhere and we want to be smart and safe about how we store them. Um, and we'll discuss the process hazards associated with that. Um, We'll provide you some guidance, so that's some really good value you can get out of here. Um, what research is out there, what codes and standards are out there, and what guides are out here. There is information out there, but it's like still developing. And uh, depending on what geographic region you are, it can be much different compared to here in the US or um, in Europe, for example. And then lastly, you know, there's a way to meet those codes and standards prescriptively. Um, or via performance-based methods. We're just going to like touch on that very lightly and then provide you guys with some key takeaways, some things you know, that would be good to remember um, when you walk away from this. So the goal of the presentation today is um, you know, to inform about the hazards associated with lithium-ion batteries in a manufacturing environment. You know, so we all, I think here there's a big show it's, that's very enthusiastic about the implementation of lithium-ion batteries. Um, you know, uh, it's very important to have that technology available also for like decarbonization, et cetera. Um, but there, it comes with some hazards, you know, and it's important that we are aware of those so that we can, um, uh, can put uh, mitigation measures in place to make sure that like plant workers or operators, you know, uh, can go home uh, well at night. So we'll showcase some of the ideas for safety solutions and then again, provide you with uh, the key takeaways. So Jensen Hughes, my company, um, we are a global firm, got a global reach. Um, we are about 1,400 people strong. The majority of those, um, about 1,000, are engineers or scientists. Um, our core business is uh, fire protection, but really anything safety related. Um, and um, we are like, present in uh, not just the battery industry, we are like uh, present in various industry. What's applicable here maybe from the overview is, is that we provide a safety concept for mission critical applications, data centers in particular. It's, it's getting very popular that data centers use lithium ion batteries for power resiliency, power backup. Generally the power industry, backup power through uh, batteries, but also science and technology mainly laboratories that develop new batteries, and of course the mass production of those. Um, our core capabilities, talking about like uh, electric vehicle and battery manufacturing, as well as energy storage, mainly relates to uh, code and standard consulting. You know? So it's sometimes not, the codes are out there, as I mentioned, they're constantly developing. They're sometimes not the easiest to understand so that's like a service that we provide to, uh, to consult on what needs to be, what the requirements are for your facility, for your application, and how those con can be met. And if there are any gaps, you know, we get involved with fire and smoke explosion control system design, mechanical or structural questions, electrical safety questions, risk analysis that's always required. You know, the moment we have more than uh, 600 kilowatt hours of lithium ion batteries anywhere in a room, you got to have a risk analysis. You got to justify what you're doing for safety. And then that hand in hand with emergency uh, action plans and emergency response plans. Um, 
that's what we combine. And um, in the unfortunate uh, case of an event, um, we have a forensics unit that can help with a, with a failure analysis, you know, to make sure that this event does not happen um, again. All right. That brings us to the introduction to lithium ion batteries. Um, at, a, at a show like this, you know, I think you are all very much familiar um, uh, what that means. I'm just going to go over it very quickly here before I turn over the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Satula, to talk about more deeper about the process hazards. Um, but generally, you know, lithium ion batteries, we're dealing with cells, with packs, and different chemistries. Um, when we look at the little chart on the right here, you know, we have the anode to the left, cathode to the right, separator in the middle, ions jump, uh, jump across left to right depending on you know, if the battery is being charged or discharged. Um, if there's an issue with the separator and it comes to unintended mixing of chemistry, you know, we are talking about uh, um, potentially a thermal runaway situation which can have a bad outcome. Um, the batteries are typically packed, how we can see here on the floor, there are several vendors showing their batteries, either in prismatic housings in the upper right, or like a cylindrical form factor, like an 18650 in the sensor, or like a pouch cell, you know, how we also know that from uh, consumer electronics. Since we will be talking a little bit about fire, important to notice there are different chemistries out there. Lithium ion chemistries, I'm only mentioning three here, NMC, NCA, and LFP. There are more out here, but these are the most popular ones. And um, what's important to say is this is not water reactive. So if there would be a fire, it's okay to put water on it because there is no lithium metal involved in, in uh, this chemistry. So now let's briefly talk about um, thermal runaway. As I mentioned, you know, if we, have an, if, we have an, if we have an issue with a separator and have unintended mixing of chemistry, uh, an exothermic chemical reaction might occur. Um, you know, that is called thermal runaway. That is typically associated with uh, high temperature generation rates. If it's in a containment, also high pressure generation rates. Um, that condition is typically caused by, could be a lingering manufacturing defect, or an overcharge condition, failure of the battery management system or the inverter or the charger that will not stop charging the cell, an overheating condition that could be if there would be uh, something producing heat in the room where the batteries are in. You know, it could be, could be a, a fire, a, a cable fire of an auxiliary power supply that provides this overheat onto the battery um, or mechanical abuse, you know, which could be that could happen during transportation or during an earthquake, for example. The picture in the middle shows how this looks like. You know, this is a cylindrical cell. This was driven into thermal runaway uh, through overcharge. And you can see like, that there is like a jet, like a cone of like, white vapors escaping from it. That's like the electrolyte basically jetting into the room. There's also fire involved. This is like um, you know, the gases that are coming out of the battery. Um, catching fire. They are flammable. In a, in a consumer application, the picture on the right shows um, that happened last year in Ontario. There was an electric vehicle parked in this uh, garage, this attached garage of the house. Um, we don't know what the root cause was, but this uh, battery pack in this vehicle experienced a thermal runaway. It released flammable gases into the garage. It found an ignition source and it came to an explosion. And you can see like the garage door basically acted as a deflagration vent and was launched across the street. Um, to talk for, to characterize the hazard a little further, um, here are like some numbers on this, okay? So here's like the chemistries, the three big ones I was talking about before. And if a cell like this goes into thermal runaway, um, you're mainly dealing with um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and hydrocarbons. So hydrocarbons are flammable. Hydrogen is flammable over a wide range of concentrations, right? And um, we can also have toxic components depending on the type of the reaction. So you could find hydrogen fluoride or hydrogen cyanide in that off gas. Um, 
I put the table in this presentation because it provides you with a good rule of thumb what gas volume to expect. So like the volume of flammable gas released per cell on a watt hour basis, so liters per watt hour. And you know, when you do that math, you're getting numbers that for example, like a 100 amp hour type of cell, you know, would release anywhere between 100 or 200 liters of flammable gas. And that uh, brings us to the switch. Jason, welcome. All right. Thank you, Jens. Thank you. All right, great. OK, so I'm going to uh, take over from Jens here. I'm Jason Satula. I've got a couple of degrees in fire protection engineering, as well as a PhD in combustion. Um, and I've been very fortunate over the last eight years or so to really dig into the problem of lithium ion batteries and how to adequately protect them. So today, I'm going to just jump right in and build on what Jens was talking about and uh, break us out from looking at cells at the very small scale and try to think about them a little bit uh, more in the context of um, where does the hazard exist when we're dealing with manufacturing, uh, potentially for EV. So it, it doesn't uh, just limit ourselves to EV. Any manufacturing or storage application where lithium ion cells are located presents a potential hazard that we need to address. So first, let's uh, figure out what uh, storage represents. So we've got a couple of pictures up here. You've seen many of these cells. Um, Jens has already talked about the form factors. There's cylindrical cells, prismatic, um, and pouch cells. We have them bundled into successive larger and larger modules. Uh, and eventually, um, we'll get up to very large scale um, battery packs that could drive vehicles. We can also find this sitting in uh, small cell format, maybe in cardboard boxes and warehouses. Um, this is a, an area that is not very well addressed by formulaic building and fire codes. So for anybody who is uh, designing a warehouse for cell storage or for manufacturing, ultimately you're going to have a place where raw materials come in, uh, potentially get turned into a battery, and then they're stored at some point. Um, maybe you're involved with manufacturing and you are importing your cells, and they come in in boxes and get stored somewhere and then get assembled. Um, all of these environments create unique hazards that uh, have the potential to create large fires that um, should be addressed by fire suppression methods. Yep, we talked about this one. All right, so some of the less common applications. So lately I've uh, um, been getting calls from certain clients who are interested in um, maybe running an option that isn't um, thought of as highly as an EV, uh, EV manufacturing plant. And they're saying things like, if I decide to store e-bikes or e-scooters in a certain area, do I need to be concerned about the hazard associated with that? Um, so in this case, um, this is definitely lithium ion battery storage. What about uh, something like this? This is really small scale, and I've seen this come across my desk a few times now over the last year. Uh, individuals are interested in storing things even smaller scale, but have been um, promoting an idea of a uh, basically a flammable liquids cabinet that's designed for lithium ion batteries. Is this a feasible idea? And um, but does this require something other than what the manufacturer is recommending? And that, I believe, uh, from our perspective, is something that needs to be addressed with an analysis. Um, and part of that is because of what you saw with uh, Jens's discussion on his slide with a garage door ending up in somebody else's um, yard across the street. You could imagine if we have a failure in one of these cabinets, if it's not blast rated, then there might be an issue. I'm definitely not saying that this is not a good idea. All I'm saying is that it just needs to be uh, addressed from a suppression perspective to find out where is this applicable, where can it actually be used. And then finally, this is the big scale of storage. Uh, this is an automated storage retrieval system. You find this absolutely in manufacturing. Automation is the way to go for many things. 
Um, and in this case, you can find uh, automated storage retrieval systems for raw storage of product. You can find it for raw cell storage. And you can find it actually in the formation process. When you're creating batteries, automated storage systems will be used with cranes to move the various cells through their different parts of formation, aging, charge discharge, um, maybe a high temperature room, depending on where they are in the process of forming the, the battery itself. All right, so why do we really care about this? I think Inns did a good job leading us in to start thinking about fire and um, explosion hazards. But as a reminder, um, when we're dealing with our traditional lithium ion uh, cell technology that is uh, becoming more and more uh, mature, we are dealing with a technology that is the only commercially mass produced uh, energy storage battery that has a flammable electrolyte. Um, yes, we are moving in a direction to try to find um, less fire hazard uh, products that can be manufactured in, in our uh, battery systems. But for now, we are, when we're doing mass production of lithium ion, we have to deal with this particular problem. So the electrolyte um, is uh, flammable, and the electrolyte is used to dissolve a salt. Lithium hexafluorophosphate is one of the main ones that's used. There are several others out there, but um, having the electrolyte dissolves the salt into the cell itself, and that results in some big benefits. That's why this conference exists. We have uh, large energy densities, very useful, huge current potentials all associated with the cell. So it, um, it's a fabulous piece of technology. We just need to work a little bit harder to make sure that it stays safe um, over time. If a cell goes into thermal runaway and it starts to break down and release gas, uh, you can produce a uh, roughly 30% hydrogen gas profile with a balance being uh, constituent gases, some hydrocarbons, um, CO2 and CO. Uh, all of these gases come into play whether the cell breaks into a flaming reaction or a gaseous reaction, um, but both hazards can be addressed. The intensity of this reaction is really a function of a couple of different things. Um, the size of the battery really comes into play. Cell chemistry absolutely comes into play. Construction of the uh, cell and the state of charge of the cell. All of this uh, can be correlated through some research that has been conducted over the years to get a better feel for what type of hazard we're actually dealing with. Ooh, a nice video here. So this was one of the uh, still frames that you saw earlier in the talk, but this is the actual testing. This is from 2010, uh, so it is a little bit dated, but it is some of the early technology. Um, this is a module pack that contained 18650 cells that were bundled together. And as you can tell, with a simple Nichrom wire overheating wrapped around a single cell, inducing thermal runaway, we were able to um, get a violent explosive reaction. This is not really news to anybody that's sitting in this room here. Um, I'm sure all of you have spent some time checking out YouTube. You can just type in lithium ion fire uh, and have a field day with the amount of videos that uh, show up. Some of the more common ones you'll find are the hoverboard incidents. Those are very entertaining, um, as well as a bevy of uh, EV manufacturers who shall remain nameless and their vehicles on the streets um, having incidents. Here's another little fun video. This is a standard, quote unquote, standard nail penetration test. Um, the, I laugh at the standardization of it because it is not necessarily a realistic failure condition for what we deal with in the field, uh, but it is still a very 100% um, uh, sure way to make sure that a lithium ion battery fails. So this really drives the ship a little bit about why the failure um, occurs. The, the idea behind a cell when it gets damaged is that you really want to do your best to make sure that the separator remains in place and that the anode and the cathode do not talk to each other since they don't play nice. If you uh, break that and can short across the separator from one to the other, you will go into thermal runaway and produce the violent reaction. So the nail penetration test ensures that that happens right off the bat. All right, we can further break down this concept of 
um, uh, state of charge for a battery for what will happen. So one thing that um, we've noted in the research over the years is that when you're dealing with standard chemistries of lithium ion batteries that are around 50%, and this is a, just a general rule of thumb because obviously this is a dependent variable, um, but once we get above 50%, we are considering ourselves in a higher state of charge um, state of the battery. That, those two videos that you saw just a minute ago, those are representative high state of charge. So when the failure is initiated, whether through um, being induced thermally or by forcing the short circuit with that nail penetration testing, we get a violent flaming reaction. The electrolyte will burn vigorously. You can generate overpressures uh, that can result in explosions. Um, and you can also, as you're burning, liberate acid gases such as hydrogen and fluoride, which are toxic components. Um, that can also be a bit of a life safety issue, as well as uh, other issues associated with uh, toxicity, even going to your electrical equipment. So imagine having a hot smoke laden with HF descending upon all of your manufacturing equipment and the acid uh, deciding to etch and eat away all of the electronics that were hard fought and won to be put into that machinery. Um, not actually an ideal solution and makes cleaning of that um, and, uh, very uh, difficult. Extinguishment does play to your strength here. So if you go with a water-based system, which is always recommended, uh, the water will um, uh, mix with the acid and dilute it back to neutral pH. So that is a win um, as long as it suppresses early. All right, and, ooh, and one other thing, HF. Um, if you're not familiar with smelling that, it smells like smelling salts. I don't know how many people are familiar with smelling salts anymore, but it's a very sharp smell designed to wake you up if you pass out. Um, but that just gives an idea of what that smell is uh, when you smell it burning. So once we get below 50%, we start to get into this range where it'll be likely that an EV, when it still goes into thermal runaway, will not ignite. And so sometimes these cells or modules or packs will be called smokers. Um, if you've heard that term, term before, but it's not necessarily smoke, it's a um, flammable electrolyte that is leaking out from either the cell or the battery pack. Um, and once we get even further down to 30%, we really reduce the likelihood that we have a problem with uh, the, the cell going into this thermal runaway state. Um, that is traditionally the research value that drives the ship for transportation based requirements that you've heard about where uh, do not ship any raw cells that are above 30 percent unless they're perhaps packaged in equipment and then you have some different flexibility for uh, shipping. Uh, electrolyte smell is very similar to vomit. This is a sci scientific and technical term, vomit, um, but uh, at least it gives somebody, again, an idea of what this would smell. And having done battery testing myself, I can verify these uh, terms. It is not pleasant, and I use my uh, P100 respirator for all of the, the testing, because once you smell it, you realize that you should not be breathing in those chemicals. Um, and certainly, ventilation is good, but it takes a while for it to keep up with that. So what are the effects that uh, result in these, these failures? We have, um, over time, we have experience with why this occurs, physical damage, the nail penetration test is really what um, uh, kind of drove the idea behind what that physical damage is. But anything that can damage a battery, crush, um, having it fall off uh, a pallet that was uh, being drug around by a forklift, something along those lines, that's where that area is. Overcharging certainly is one of the more critical areas where we can have a problem. Discharge rates greater than design, so charging and discharge also come into play. Battery manufacturing defects, despite our best efforts, they do exist, and as back battery technology has become um, more robust over the years, manufacturers have worked very hard to get these failure rates uh, to a range between 10 to the negative 6, 10 to the negative 9. Um, obviously, the further we push that up, the better off we'll be on having spontaneous failures in the field. Uh, but the downside is that, judging by the amount of interest in this particular show, we're now using this technology across a range of products. And so the penetration of the market for cells to actually go into things that we use on a daily basis has gone up. And there are billions of cells now roughly in circulation uh, that have the potential to fail. 
On the fire protection side, there's a several organizations that have worked really hard to try to make lithium ion batteries safe. Uh, the U.S. Navy has been very interested. They're early adopters of uh, lithium ion uh, technology as well as lithium primary cells um, back, oof, I'm going to go with the 80s to 90s. I should know this off the top of my head. So little known fact, my, my father was a PhD chemist that worked for Department of Defense, U.S. Navy, uh, as well as Department of Energy. So he was, as a battery chemist, we had discussions about lithium ion uh, technology at the dinner table. Uh, when I was in high school. Um, and he was very proud that he was one of the co-inventors of a lithium primary cell. So I guess it was destiny for me to be sitting up here and talking to you today about this. Um, other resource organizations, FM Global, UL, Fire Protection Research Foundations, um, these groups have gone a long way to try to do bulk fire testing of lithium ion to figure out what is the best way to protect that. And then of course, private industry, um, such organizations as ours, Jensen Hughes. We've done a lot of proprietary testing that I'm not allowed to tell you about. All right, government agencies, uh, water suppression has been the main suppression topic that we've landed on as being the most effective. As Jens mentioned, metallic lithium is not contained in lithium ion batteries, so it's okay to put large quantities of water in order to extinguish a lithium ion battery fire. Uh, other studies have been conducted to look at effectiveness of, say, clean agents. You may or may not be familiar with FM200 or Novec. Those are uh, clean agents that came out as a result of Halon being banned all those years ago, rightly so. Um, these uh, uh, gaseous agents are very good at putting out visible flame sheets. So if you have a lithium ion cell that is actively burning, the flame sheet will be extinguished, but the thermal reaction that's actually in the cell will not be eliminated. That's why water is still preferred in order to make sure that the cell itself is cooled while it continues reacting. Based on that research, there have been some rules of thumb, we'll call them for now, that give us some protection requirements. Some of these will make sense if you've uh, played around with any building or fire codes where there are requirements for sprinkler systems and things. Uh, so the, that top one up there, 0.3 gallons per minute per foot squared over 2,500 feet is a sprinkler density that can be used to create a fire protection system. Uh, there's a second one here that's a K360 liter minute bar. Now we're flipping over to uh, SI units. Um, and again, the, the idea is just to give a basic spec to allow what kind of water amount do we really need in order to defend a, ha a hazard. Unfortunately, all of these are tested very specifically to certain ceiling heights, rack configurations, pallets, uh, and so there's a, a little bit of nuance and work that needs to go into actually coming up with something from these recommendations. There's a bunch of other uh, data sheets that FM, uh, FM Global has put together. And they, in their research, will call out certain data sheets to say, now that we've researched lithium ion batteries, we may not have researched every single lithium ion battery and every single um, equation that we know how these, uh, these fires are going to occur. But we're pretty confident from all the testing that we've done that lithium ion batteries behave in this fashion at this size. And that matches very well with other fire testing that we've done in very hazardous configurations. So the idea. Uh, is that FM's data can be used and applied um, even if it is not written into a code to give some semblance of guidance for worst case scenarios for what level of water density you might need in a facility. And there's a plethora, I always wanted to use plethora during a, uh, during a talk, um, of other standards that are out there, 855, UL 9, uh, 9540, those are the real big ones, 855. Uh, specific to energy storage systems, but it's moving to storage areas as well. So the next version will have some requirements along those lines. Uh, 9540 and 40A are testing specific. So those um, will, if anybody is involved in energy storage systems, you want to get your system listed. UFL, UL 9540A is the way to go. And then a range of others all the way down to the cell level. In the IFC, that's our uh, main international fire code. Um, the language, for the most part, mirrors 855 now. This has been upgraded just in the 2021 cycle. Um, and AHJs are actively now pouring over this. AHJ stands for authority having jurisdiction. So those of you in building facilities who might be trying to get permitting for a new application of a building that 
involves lithium ion manufacturing or storage, uh, we'll be dealing with AHJs that are up to date and aware along these lines. Um, but we have best practices that we can uh, recommend in order to make this process a little bit easier. And um, yeah, all right. So what are these best practices? You know, first, I want to reiterate that uh, lithium ion in general, each application is highly unique. And that's why I start off talking about all those different storage configurations. Because even once we have uh, building code guidance that is codified and adopted by jurisdictions, it's still not going to tell the whole story about what that particular hazard is for that space and whether or not the space is actually adequately protected. Um, so having some sort of analysis up front to determine that through hazard mitigation, fire hazard, maybe a risk analysis uh, is always recommended. Best practice number two is adequate fire detection and notification. Um, right now, there are many technologies that are available to try to sense when a battery might be going into thermal runaway or when it has burst into flame, uh, all of which gives some advantage to a person at a facility with being able to respond earlier and make a decision on what to do. If it's a very small uh, setup and there's an emergency response team, there's a chance that the hazard could be removed from the structure. Um, or if that is not the way a client wishes to go, it can remain in place uh, and the fire service can come and be responsible for taking care of the hazard. Best practice number three is water-based fire protection. Obviously, I've talked about that a little bit at length already from the research. Um, this is a chart pulled straight out of NFPA 13, which provides densities uh, for how much water you would actually need. Uh, but again, and it, some sort of analysis needs to be done to determine what amount of water do you need at the roof? And if you have an in-rack system, how much water would you need in that as well? Best practices number four, if possible, um, we need to talk about separation. So separation really comes into play um, with enclosure. So in a large space like this, you could imagine we have a manufacturing operation set up in here. And for the most part, depending on how big the operation is scaled, we may not want to provide any separations, and that's okay. The problem comes when areas that are already segregated, um, maybe with smaller storage areas, and those get designated as a place to put lithium ion within a larger facility. Then we start to get back to having to address the hazards that Jens pointed out with the garage and having garage doors blow off. So that's really the concept of um, why separation becomes important. So in those spaces, then maybe it is appropriate to go ahead and do some rating technology. But as of right now, uh, ratings are not necessarily in any building code other than for energy storage system specific operations. And so that's where this one, two, and three hours come from. Best practice is number five. Um, because lithium ion is unpredictable and we're not really sure if and when a spontaneous failure would occur, um, it is a really good idea to make sure that when lithium ion is in a facility that it is away from everything else. Um, do not put your lithium ion next to other cardboard boxes that are filled with um, uh, you know, acids or oils or gasoline or, I mean, uh, uh, some of that might sound like a little bit of common sense, but especially for warehouse environments where sometimes the, the goal is to do short-term um, filling of the warehouse with product and then having it distributed down uh, the chain, you could end up with a large amount of lithium ion in close proximity to common combustibles. And so having that mixed together come, becomes hazardous if they can't be separated from each other. Best practices number six is ventilation. So again, this goes back to our garage and making sure that as the enclosure shrinks around our lithium ion application, we are paying attention to ventilation as a method of prevention to make sure that we are explosion safe um, as opposed to not being necessarily fire safe. Um, this is most applicable when we're dealing with energy storage systems, ESS, um, using the code language that we have available and the, the guides that are available to us now. Most of the energy storage system requirements will result in a need for some type of either deflagration venting or explosion um, prevention systems, which is basically fresh air coming in from a different source, exhausting the air that's in that container space uh, out to the world. Um, but if not, vents may be the way to go. 
And we do have a little bit of a rule of thumb that has developed uh, on this end with between one and four air changes per hour typically is enough for a single cell uh, to be diluted enough if by some chance it went into a, a non-venting thermal runaway. All right. And then final best practice here is the development strongly recommended of an um, uh, EMP. So this would be your emergency management plan. Uh, most clients' facilities have standard operating procedures and emergency response already in place. So once lithium ion is looked at, this should be a separate section that then gets taken into account within that. Um, and of course, uh, there are some guidelines on how to go about developing that. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Mark. All right, thank you, Jason. As he said, my name is Mark Susky, and we're gonna take a few seconds here in a few minutes, actually, the last few slides to talk about some of the performance-based design alternatives that we have to ensure that some of those areas that are not covered under the prescriptive code. Um, and one last comment I wanted to kind of little catch up on what Jason just said with his EMP and your emergency plan. It's also not a bad idea to talk to the local the fire department and find out what their capabilities are. What do they have in place? What can they do for you? You know, because these are these can have the potential to be significant fires, and we want to make sure that we're addressing those. Can everybody hear me? Am I holding this right? So we want to make sure that we in, you know, engage them early. So I just wanted to mention that, circle back. Okay, so up on the screen we have an example of what we call the um, Computational Fluid Dynamics, or CFD. And it's a computer-based program that models gases. So we can input the specific gases we're looking to model. And in this scenario, we're doing it in an ESS building, where these batteries are stored in a you know, contained area. And as you can see, it, one is with the HVAC off and how the gas would just naturally migrate throughout the space. And the second is with the HVAC on and how then it would, the, the HVAC systems would affect the gas. This allows us to you know, use a more scientific method when we're looking at potentially putting in gas detectors to you know, detect a potential leak or a potential vent. This would provide us a scientific method instead of just saying, hey, let's just put them wherever. The next um, program we use is Fire Dynamic Simulator, or FDS. Um, this allows us to create and use another computer-based program to create, for the lack of a better term, computer-based fake fires. Um, we, we input the data um, for all of the, when we do the research on whatever the chemicals are in, and we, we, we create this, we enter all that data into a computer and it provides our information. We, we run into this a lot because these battery manufacturing plants are very large, and we run into a lot of times, we run into code issues because of potentially egress issues with getting people out of the building in time. Um, this program allows us to look at the flame spread throughout the facility, and also allows us to provide a snapshot of what the visibility is, so I know I can A, safely have my um, occupants evacuate, and B, I can make sure that when the firefighters come in, they can properly fight this fire. So in conjunction with the FDS, we also have several other programs. One is actually a program called DTAC. It's been around for a long time. It basically, look, we input the data, ceiling height, sprinkler type, all those things, and it allows us to predict, inputting into FDS, it allows us to predict what uh, fire size I'm going to have at the time my sprinklers activate and we can change the different types of sprinklers, we can look at different you know, aspects, different spacings. So it allows us to, as you know, um, Jason and Jens were saying, put a lot of water on these fires right away. Um, it also helps us determine sprinkler activation time, fire growth. The other large component of this is how do we get the people out of the building? It, it allows us once again to get our occupants out safely. And we've also, using FDS, we've also, um, interject, sometimes we interject HF into our fire plume so we can detect some of those, those chemicals that are interjected into the system. So that's really about it. I mean, we have um, um, any questions or comments from, the, from anybody? We'd love to take a question. Like I said, I, I didn't mean to rush through that, but there, we could do another very deep dive into the performance-based design realm, and we could be here for another you know, day and a half. So, yep, you guys want to come back up on the stage and...
concern the depth and test to okay. What is the definition of temporary storage for batteries? What was that question again? Oh, temporary storage. So the question was, what is the definition of temporary storage? Uh, that is a very good question because the temporary storage, depending upon what application are you talking about. Um, you know, are you talking about, you know, like in the EV world here, are we talking about after we manufacture the battery, are we just bringing batteries to the floor to get inserted into the vehicle? Or are we talking about maybe having our huge amounts of raw product temporarily stored in a warehouse before we put them in our production line. So it's not a cut and dry, simple. The batteries themselves, yeah. Generally, the rule of thumb was day use, you know, whatever you're gonna use in a day. That's what rule of thumb we've always had. Yeah, and there's also, when we're talking about energy storage again, so mainly batteries in a container, there's actually an NFPA 855 a day rule for it. And now I would have to look that up, but I believe it's 90 days. So if you store longer than 90 days, it's automatically permanent storage. Well, and, and you also have lifetime too, right? How many batteries can you put in a day? Is that considered temporary here? I think it could. I think, you know, coming back to, to Mark's comment, it's like you got to evaluate it on a case by case basis, you know, and that's like, one thing we also tried to show here, like that every lithium ion battery um, um, application is somewhat unique and sometimes you really need to just get the authorities into a meeting and explain to them what your process is and hopefully come out with a reasonable, you know, a solution agreement. Yeah, so basically in the manufacturing realm, I mean, normally we would, you know, we have a lot of times where they say they're going to bring the batteries in right before they go into the production. Um, how many is that determines on how many they're going to produce, what the storage size is, and I'll be up front with you. It really depends upon the protection strategies we have in place. You know, how are we protecting that? Are we, you know, just going to storm? You know, some people like to put uh, draft curtains around that storage space on the production line, and then I can put ESFRs up at the ceiling, and then I could potentially store more. That's where those computational computer analysis programs come in because I can you know, look at that if you wanted to store more in a certain area, we can model that you know, using a computer-based program, predict the fire size, sprinkler activation, and then make an educated judgment of, okay, yeah, we can put a sprinkler system up there that's gonna work, or no, we don't think we can, so we have to scale back. So I, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but the code does not say you, yeah, yeah. Well, the code doesn't say you can have like 10, most, the vast majority use like how much they're going to use in production for like a shift. That's kind of what we've been hearing with manufacturing with EVs. That's, that's. So the, the basic idea is uh, you run a hazard analysis and then you, you figure out for sure <laughs> or risk, you know, risk assessment as well, quantify. Oh, so give me, give me a call. <laughs> All right. Any other, yeah, that's right. Uh, questions, other questions? We want to give time just to make sure. We have about like a minute, minute left, so we can certainly take another one. Does your company provide process hazard analysis for electric vehicle manufacturing? Yes, absolutely. Process hazard analysis, uh, fire hazard analysis, lithium ion battery specific hazard analysis, um, as well as fire risk assessment with quantification of the risk itself. So we'll cover the, the grand range for you. We put you on the spot. We'll be around uh, for sure to uh, answer all of your other burning questions. Just feel free. We're pretty approachable, as you can tell, because I like to throw in the 
really bad one-liners every now and then in my, my talk, so. And yeah, if you, if you want to follow up later, so feel free to, to scan this QR code up here. Um, that'll send an email directly to us. You can get a copy of the presentation. Um, you can get our fly sheet electronically. And it, the same QR code was like taped to a couple of the chairs here when you came in, you know. So that's a good way to get in touch with us. So, and um, yeah, we'll be here for the next two, three days. We're going to be at the various receptions in the evening. So we're happy to have a, have a drink with you guys and, uh, you know, mingle about this further. So thank you very much for coming.